go right to the introduction of the speaker. So today's speaker is Sean Mayer. Uh, and Sean is a, I pronounce it correctly? Mar. Mar, I'm sorry, Sean. I know you as Sean. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Sean a, is a postdoc at the MBZ with, uh, with Craig Moritz. And Steve, yeah. Oh, and Steve, sorry. And, uh, and he did his PhD at the University of Kansas, I just learned, where he worked with, uh, with Bob Tim and with Town Peterson. And uh, he just told me that when I when I put my slide up a couple of weeks ago with showing Sulawesi, he was just like, oh, not again. <laughs> you see so much of that from the KU crowd. Uh, and then he, uh, after he left Kansas, where he was working on the plague system, then he went to Georgia for a postdoc where he was in John Drake's lab, and that's where he did the white nose syndrome work that he's also going to be presenting. Presenting. Uh, and here in the NBC, I think he's doing something else. He'll tell us a little yeah. bit about it before he gets in and talks about these um, these completed projects. So, yeah. Sean, welcome. All right, thank you. And don't worry, everybody doesn't say my name right. It's <laughs> fine. Uh, can you hear me in the back okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, so here uh, I'm actually not working on disease systems per se. I'm actually working on an extension of the Grinnell Resurvey Project that was, uh, um, uh, initially it's a grant that Tony Lynn Morelli wrote, if you're familiar with what she was working on. And we're estimating climate refugia for a lot of those critters, uh, the mammals, uh, and then looking at connectivity. Um, between sites and then estimating that into the future to kind of understand where species might go and whether or not they can make it there. So that's what I'm working on here. Uh, I've only been here for six months, so that's not enough to actually get anything done, right? Uh, so uh, instead, I'm going to talk about a couple different uh, papers that I did in my past, uh, particularly this uh, plague and white nose syndrome uh, that were part of my dissertation and then also a uh, side project from what I was actually paid to do at Georgia. Um, this is dead. Okay. Um, so uh, much like last week, uh, my talk will be split into two halves. Um, so we'll, I'll talk about play for 20 minutes or so, and then white nose syndrome for about 20 minutes or so. Um, in plague, I'll briefly, uh, we're going to do an e &M approach and test for similarity between uh, hosts and plague distributions. And then for white nose syndrome, uh, we're gonna, I'll walk you through some dispersal kernels and model comparison, and then project the most well-supported model into the future to estimate uh, where white nose will spread and how fast and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so getting right into it, uh, plague is uh, caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. This is the black death uh, that you are probably familiar with from your history lessons. Uh, this is a nice picture from the internet of the actual uh, bacteria, your pestis. Uh, plague occurs throughout the world. Uh, it originated um, in Asia and then has since spread in multiple iterations um, through time. In general, uh, plague in the wild is spread by fleas. Uh, the cool thing about fleas is they are going to take a blood meal um, and assuming they feed on an infected individual, they, uh, they, uh, they'll take in blood, but then within the blood you'll have the bacterium uh, just replicate, replicate, replicate and create what's called a mid-gut blockage. Be careful on Googling mid-gut blockage. You get a lot of things. You don't expect. Uh, but you do get this, this image. Uh, and essentially, you get uh, starving spreaders because with the mid-gut blockage, you, uh, the flea actually can't take in the blood meal. But when it bites a susceptible individual, it will spread the bacteria. And then the mid-gut blockage reemerges. They go starving again and bite like crazy. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and in some fleas, I'll just mention this right now, um, the, the mid-gut blockage doesn't always occur throughout its life cycle, and sometimes it doesn't occur at all. So keep that in mind when you have cavities. <laughs> um, so in the United States, we think of, uh, well, when I think of plague, I think of prairie dogs. Uh, there's been a lot of work on prairie dog plague uh, because prairie dogs live in these communal uh, uh, groups to, prairie dog towns, when plague gets through there, it just rips right through in this big epizootics. So you can have towns of hundreds of individuals just disappear within a week, uh, and just about everybody's dead. And so that's, a, that's a, an epizootic cycle. So everybody gets sick um, and dies. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you can have these enzootic cycles. Um, 
So here's a, uh, an idea of what the epizootic, where you have fairy dogs, where everybody dies, <coughs> it rips through real fast like wildfire. You can have these enzootic cycles, where you have few individuals that are dying, and it, you just kind of have this low-level maintenance uh, presence of plague somewhere in the background. Um, and then eventually, maybe it jumps to a different host, and that's when the epizootic cycle comes out. And so the ecology and the difference between these enzootic and epizootic cycles have been studied a lot, like in Colorado. Um, however, you, with these enzootic cycles, how it gets here, you can have some incidental hosts like coyotes, uh, cats, and rabbits, I guess. Uh, presumably, one of the things that have, looked, have been looked at quite frequently are whether or not uh, uh, things like coyotes eating uh, dead organisms, dead prairie dogs, that's how it moves uh, through space. That's an, another, another line of research that I'm not going to talk about. But the bottom line here is uh, there are lots of different hosts of this little figure, including humans, right? So here's the pneumonic plague. That's when you think of uh, Black Death in our history. Uh, but for the most part, we're talking about fleas and movement by fleas. But you see a lot of different mammal hosts, right? Um, and so what's going on here, and that's what I was really interested in, uh, in terms of the different mammal hosts. In specifically North America, plague was introduced in the late 19th century, just outside uh, in San Francisco. Um, it spread through ground squirrels and to about the 100th meridian. So if you don't know where that is, it's kind of like right here. This is called the plague line, right? So plague basically occurs somewhere over here and rarely occurs over here, or it doesn't occur over here, I should say. Uh, so what maintains this plague line? And that was another factor we were interested in, because we have lots of hosts that cross this plague line, but um, plague doesn't actually occur there. So part of my dissertation, one of the ideas I had was to look at, try to find plague in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, and uh, I didn't, so that didn't work out too well. <laughs> Okay, uh, but plague does still occur. Uh, this was, I gave essentially the same talk a couple weeks ago, uh, and Espum and uh, Michelle Koo pointed out to me whether or not I had heard about this, so I Googled it real quick. So you can see this was posted and updated on September 6th, uh, and she picked it up from picking up a half-eaten squirrel carcass and the fleas associated there. So. Your take-home message from this slide is don't pick up half-dead, eaten squirrels. <laughs> or let your children do that. <laughs> okay, so uh, in general, I'm going to try and ask uh, a couple questions with regards to plague. First, do hosts constrain the pathogen? So is there some sort of host distribution, amalgam of host distributions that relate to this uh, distribution we see in North America? Or are there other ecological factors uh, presumably climate that might be limiting uh, the occurrence of plague in North America. Uh, so we have two different hypotheses to, that I'm going to test. The first is this host niche hypothesis. So we have environmental, this is an environmental space, not geographic space, so we have say, precipitation and temperature. We have uh, four different hosts here, and everywhere within this big blob, we have plague, right? So that would suggest that there are certain hosts that are actually forcing plague to occur, or allow plague to occur. Whereas we could have uh, a big blotchy figure where we have multiple hosts that occur in different parts of environmental space, and where they overlap with our blob, they get plague. So this is our kind of plague niche hypothesis. That we only see uh, plague in certain environmental conditions, and the hosts have to co-occur with that to actually come down or be susceptible. So this, we basically get a couple sets of uh, hypotheses we can test, or uh, not hypotheses, but uh, different things we can test. Do we see a distinct ecological profile of plague? For the plague niche hypothesis, we should see that, whereas with the host niche hypothesis, we should not see that, because each one should be independent uh, for each host, right? Um, and then a difference between host and infected ecological profile, this may not hold the case, or are we, yeah. the host niche hypothesis, we don't really have something to predict, whereas the plague niche hypothesis, we expect that to occur. See that difference? So I'm going to take a distribution modeling framework. So 
This is our little Venn diagram from uh, Soberone and Soberone and Peterson, uh, where we have biotic conditions, abiotic conditions. So this is like climate. These are you know, prey-based, those sorts of things, habitat. Uh, and movement, which is something like dispersal. And essentially, when we draw occurrence records, we're drawing from here. When we do niche models, we're then projecting somewhere into this space, right? So we should get some level of uh, uh, distribution, not necessarily the realized distribution, right? We get a potential distribution. In this instance. How this actually works in practice, we have some occurrence information, these dots, this is a map or the easting. Then we have some environmental layers, something like precipitation, temperature, variability in temperature, what have you. Uh, and then we combine these through some sort of algorithm. In general, this is Maxent. If you're in that literature, you can also look at GARP, boosted regression trees, all these other uh, types of approaches. Uh, in the end, we get something of a potential distribution uh, in geographic space. So we get a bunch of maps, which is kind of a nice thing. Uh, for this plague-related project, we're going to have two types of data. We'll have plague data, which are plague-infected host records, and uh, host data, which will be museum records. Right? For the plague data, these are georeferenced CDC records of plague-infected individuals. Uh, we had about 75 species in our data set. We then concatenated that uh, a little bit to eight taxa and eliminated a bunch of species that we only had a few occurrence records for. Uh, and these eight taxa are three species, uh, three genera, and then also two functional groups, basically like tree squirrels. Um, we then did searches on Manus and Arctos databases uh, to match those eight uh, taxa. Sorry in the back about the little slides. This is what happens when you reuse things. Uh, so the e &M methods, uh, we had seven bioclimactic layers, bioclimactic layers from WorldClim. We use Maxent, which generates this probability surface. So from zero to one, one being uh, probability of occurrence. Converted that to a binary state, zero or one. So one being presence, zero being absence, using a minimum presence threshold. Um, this is kind of easier to read and makes a little more sense for some of the analyses that I was doing. So this is what it looks like. Here are our niche model results. Uh, in yellow, we have our plague model. Our red, we have our host model. If you can make out the blue dots on here, that's host data. If you can make out black dots, those are the, the plague-related infected records. Uh, a couple take-home messages here is we have a lot of coyote plague. Um, a lot of our records from CDC came from a predator, predator control program, so they shot a lot of coyotes and tested them, and uh, so we have tons of coyotes. Uh, and many of these others we have very few, or relatively few records. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that we see this consistent Western North American pattern in our potential distribution. Right? Rarely does it bleed across the 100th meridian, with the exception, the coyotes being the obvious exception. To actually examine this, uh, there was a nice paper by Dan Warren and colleagues in 2008 in Evolution describing uh, uh, E&M tools, which is a way to actually compare different uh, E&Ms or outputs of E&Ms. Particularly, he, they presented this identity test and this background test. Uh, Peterson then showed that the identity test was overly conservative, so I'm not actually going to show that, but in general, uh, identity tests from uh, uh, a species, uh, uh, what do I want to call it? Um, an artificial species where the niche is known. Uh, the identity test rejected niche conservatism uh, where that shouldn't have been the case, whereas the background similarity test showed that there was similarity. So I'm going to use the background similarity test. How that works is we compare two geographic outputs of uh, a niche model. <laughs> We then generate random data based on one of the um, one of the two things we're comparing. Calculate how similar our random data are to our other species or other taxa. Uh, use these random data to generate a histogram, right? And then just plot the observed value over here, right? So in this case, 
Badger Plague and Ground Squirrel Plague is more similar than you'd expect by random chance. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's two things uh, I need to mention about this background similarity test is we have two distance matrices, or two distance measures, uh, Hellinger's I and Schooner's D. So when you're looking at one of these boxes here, there's an upper half and a lower half, Hellinger's I and Schooner's, uh, upper half's Hellinger's I, lower half Schooner's D. Um, and in this case, I have the host data here and versus the plague background, okay? And <coughs> comparing host to host to plague in each case, we reject similarity in this uh, for each of those models and each of those uh, different distance measures. If we open it up now to when we compare host data to any plague background data, we reject similarity throughout with the exception of prairie dog host distribution and coyote plague. When we actually compare differences or test for similarity between uh, plague and different host taxa, so here are our host taxa, uh, or yeah, here's the different host taxa infected with plague. We don't have anything on the diagonal because we're not comparing ourselves to ourselves. Uh, essentially, what we see is we fail to reject similarity in all of these cases, suggesting some level of similarity between different hosts, with the exception of coyotes. Okay? So, uh, we see a lot of support for some sort of uh, climate based ecological niche for plague in this case, except coyotes. So, do we see a distinct ecological profile of plague? I would argue that we do given that second slide where we saw all that blue versus red? And is there a difference between host and infected ecological profile? Uh, I say yes, because of that first slide where we saw red along the diagonal. So brief conclusions. <coughs> that, uh, in this case, we see plague is independent. Plague distribution is independent of the host distribution. This could be due to a variety of things, including vector ecology. Uh, it's very possible that flea <coughs> communities and differences in flea distribution could be resulting or could result in this pattern. You could also see some evolutionary dynamics at play where you have uh, development of resistance in certain host populations <coughs> occurring where in our plague zone, uh, but not outside the plague zone because they haven't been uh, uh, exposed to it yet. Uh, but we do think, I do think there's some sort of ecological niche for plague that we can use. Uh, so with climate change, we can use some climate-based models to estimate where we think plague might end up. And that's been done a little bit uh, for human cases of plague, uh, but not necessarily with uh, uh, wild cases of plague. I do want to highlight quickly about the, I didn't mention the coyotes. So one of the things that's weird about coyotes is that they'll seroconvert, and so they'll become, turn plague positive. Uh, when in fact they are actually no longer infected, and this was a serological test from the CDC that we used. So that really broad distribution of plague that you saw could actually be a result of just way too broad uh, or false positives in terms of where plague was actually occurring. Uh, didn't realize that until after we did everything. So. But I don't think it really affects our end conclusions too much. Okay, so that's the end of plague, and I'd be happy to entertain some questions on plague for a few minutes before I start talking about white nose. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, are there different species of fleas that are carrying the plague? And are yes. They on? Okay. Yeah, so different species, there's lots of different species of uh, flea are capable of transmitting plague, and their ability to transmit plague also depends on their age. So there's a lot of other underlying factors. Uh, that could cause that. Yeah? Is it possible to sample fleas uh, that are not on hosts anyway and then test them for plague? Um, so really the, the big question that people are interested in is they pull the fleas off of hosts and then test them for plague and see whether or not you can identify um, host resistance or some level of host resistance in different species and their, their fleas, right? Um, so that was another thing I tried to do. So it's pretty impossible or quite difficult to sample fleas that are not host-associated. 
like, like if free you living. Car, no. Yeah. If you walk across a carpet in an old funky Berkeley apartment, yeah, <laughs> socks can be covered with fleas. Right. Yeah. Sure. But that's kind of a special circumstance. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I hope. Yeah. I don't. I, I. I can't think of anybody that's tried to just pull fleas from a nest. Because usually the flea life cycle is really within certain hosts, right? So from they're laying eggs in a nest and then feeding on, let's say, a ground squirrel, uh, even as juveniles, right? And so kind of a related question is, how effective do you, do you think do you assess your uh, plague sampling? That is, uh, the way people find a dead animal and the right person gets it and then it's tested for flight. Whereas, uh, you know, where does that accurately represent the true uh, distribution? Um, so, of, uh, yeah. Your right. Um, so there are people, you're, yeah. Um, so some of these records pro represent um, somebody calling uh, CDC for Collins and say, I think we have an outbreak of plague, and they go out there and they run and kill critters and test individuals for plague, right? Uh, but really, sampling where you don't see plague is very rare and very difficult because like on the right side of your early diagram, you know where that where it's at low levels and you had some mouse there that was the uh, carrier. Yeah, yeah. And so on that kind of situation. Yeah, that's it's actually really tough to detect that in the host and the fleas. That's where my chapter of my dissertation failed. Um, because I was, we were trying to see if we could find enzootic plague at these high elevations and look at and compare that to a couple different things. Um, but yeah. Yep. I'm just curious about the logic of modeling coding plague and plague and plague. Is that because they transmit within species more than between, so they sort of have independent distributions? Or is it more? Methodologically, just wanting to relate the cases for coyote to the distribution of coyote, the cases for bear. It's it's the latter uh, because one of the things that people have thought about is that there are certain species that they might be driving the plague distribution, uh, or certain taxa that are driving plague distribution. And in your analyses, did you do just to combine all plague records model, which didn't distinguish what host they were? I think we did. But uh, I don't think we ever analyzed it. I think we did a map somewhere. Uh, but I don't think we analyzed it. But that would be a good, good thing to consider. We, we also tested a couple hosts that we didn't have plague data for. So the northern grasshopper mouse is uh, a big thing in Colorado, uh, the plague outbreaks there. Uh, and so we tested a bunch of species that we didn't have actual plague data from. Okay, so we can talk about white nose for uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so white nose is this emerging pathogen in North American bats. Oh, and uh, this is a paper that came out in Science a couple of years ago um, in which they were uh, modeling population declines in bats uh, in the Northeast. Um, and there's just a bunch of research going on now about um, white nose because it's a big concern. Uh, our group, uh, at, well, at Georgia, I was working with John Drake on some aquatic invasive niche models, not white nose. But we read this paper and as uh, a group, and we were we thought it was kind of interesting, and wondered what we could kind of do to also analyze some of these data. Um, and started as a group project, a lab project, let's try this, let's try that. And it evolved into what I'm about to talk about. So white nose is caused by Geomys destructans, which is a fungus. Um, you get white nose syndrome. This is the kind of the token picture you see in every white nose talk, so I have to use it. Um, but you see these little white tufts right there, that's the actual uh, fungal infection and growth. And you can kind of see little white pockets over there. Um, it in, the fungus in, infects the muzzle and the wing where there is no hair. Uh, the fungus itself is psychrophilic. I think I say that right. So it grows really well at low temperatures. 
Um, the mortality is not directly due to this infection. Rather, it is uh, other features in terms of just frequent arousal from hibernation that leads to uh, disruption of homeostasis and dehydration and starvation. Uh, coming out of hibernation and flying out looking for a quick meal and freezing to death, those are the sorts of things that are actually causing mortality, not necessarily directly from the fungus. Uh, recent evidence has shown that it's actually transmitted through direct contact uh, between bats and not necessarily uh, environmental. Uh, so there's something happening within these caves that is mediating the spread. Okay, this color didn't really work out, but um, Here's the initial spread. This is, these are just data up till last summer, June of 2011. Uh, red is this initial infection observation, and then we kind of move out uh, to the darker blue, which is the, the more new infections. And you can kind of see that it's kind of doing this sort of thing, right? Uh, I've skipped Canada for some other reasons I'll get to in a little bit. <laughs> when we actually look at how far things have spread and the distance between the nearest previously infected county, uh, in years three, or winters, three and four, uh, we have these big jumps, uh, well over 500 kilometers. Okay? And so that, to us, as uh, in the lab, we thought that was kind of crazy, like, how does it jump that far? Uh, particularly, uh, Comparing to other uh, types of uh, diseases, with, such as West Nile virus and foot and mouth disease, West Nile virus, you see this diffuse, diffusive spread from the origin, and that's thought because they have highly mobile host species, right? You have birds that are flying. Bats are also highly mobile host species, so you would think from that perspective you would see this diffusive spread. However, foot and mouth disease, uh, which is basically farms, are occurring in farms, you see a jump dispersal on a network. <coughs> so it's in one farm, and then it gets into another farm, and then it gets into another farm, right? So that's due to this patch late distribution, or patchy distribution and delay in transmission. Bats also have a patchy distribution when you think of hibernacula, because that's going to be patchy along the landscape. So what are the spread characteristics associated with white nose? And that's what we kind of wanted to investigate. Uh, kind of comparing this diffusive and jump dispersal uh, kind of characteristics. Okay. Um, yeah, there's already, there was one paper by Wilder and colleagues that showed that the probability of mortality is diffusive, uh, but that's just very local. That was just in the Northeast. Uh, we were more interested in a range-wide uh, approach. Um, there should also be some sort of uh, prevalence based on community structure. This is um, uh, the, like something like the dilution effect, where you have changes in community structure affect prevalence. Um, so likely what we thought was that host pathogen and habitat features uh, influence the greater spread, that broader spread of white nose. So we wanted to test four hypotheses with our data. Oops. Uh, the first is that geographic complexity gives rise to corridors that facilitate spread uh, along the dominant cave-bearing formations in the northeast. The second one is that spread is accelerated by high concentrations of caves, that there's something going on in these caves that are facilitating the spread, that uh, uh, this is supposed to be affected by, but spread is retarded or affected by species richness. This is the idea behind the dilution effect, and whether or not that has anything to do with white nose, we weren't sure. Um, uh, and that spread is retarded in warmer areas due to a shorter duration of cold temperatures. Uh, this is uh, a couple indirect effects that we thought might be happening here. Uh, first, that uh, cold temperatures might relate to something about the growing season. So if you have really long winters, then you have shorter growing seasons. Bats might not be in as good condition when they go in, and so you might have mortality events. There's a growing process with the fungus. So they might need more time to actually develop into the white nose uh, or the white puppy <coughs> growth. Uh, so that requires a longer incubation time, et cetera, et cetera. So to do test these four hypotheses, I'm going to use a model comparison approach where we fit uh, a bunch of uh, models. It's essentially, we're calculating the probability that site I is not infected by site J using this. Uh, and then we varied this F 
uh, which is a function which I'll show you in a second. Um, we then calculate 1 minus this p tilde to actually calculate the probability of infection and calculated the negative log likelihood uh, of the model based on that. And then these are our fun diffusion kernels, these Fs, right? So we have a simple diffusion model, a diffusion where we allow long distance dispersal, that's what this B2 up here, we allow that to vary, that creates a fat tail. Uh, we uh, used a gravity model where this NI and NJ represent the number of caves in a given county. We also did this for the area of the county. Um, we added uh, covariate, so winter length, northing, species richness, hibernating bats uh, to our <coughs> gravity model, and then we also added two covariates just to test these. And then we fit these models uh, and compared negative log likelihoods. Okay, so our current data, we use the county level records um, from up until June 2011. So we just grabbed these from Fish and Wildlife Services. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Services uh, website. We also validated a lot of these occurrence data. So we had one of the, uh, the collaborators went back and tried to find the actual records uh, so we knew what was going on uh, for each of these uh, pop-up counties. Yeah. Look, white nose in this county, that kind of thing. News records. Um, our covariates we tested were the number of caves. So uh, light green, the dark blue, this is not uh, easy scale, but uh, you can see where we have lots of caves versus not so many. Uh, one of the reasons why I don't have Canada on this map is because we don't have, we couldn't find cave data at the same scale for, uh, at the, like the, the equivalent county level scale for Canada. Here's our length of winter. What we did was we calculated the number of days below 10 degrees centigrade during the year during the epidemic, right? So uh, it makes sense, colder areas, warmer areas, right? Uh, and then we have bat species richness. So we just took NatureServe data, overlaid um, the geographic ranges of bats, and counted the number of bats that occur in that county. Uh, so we go from about 1 to almost uh, to 28 down here in the southwest. We also calculated the species richness of hibernators. These are just bats that hibernate. Okay? Um, and so you can see there's a difference between this map and that map. Right? No more hibernators right here. Okay. So we're going to do this on a network. So I just want to walk through how we actually generated this. So we're going to have all the counties in the contiguous United States. We take their centroid. Right? We remove the county. So now we just have county dots with different attributes, which were like bat species richness, hibernating species richness, temperature, and then we connect the dots. So here's our nice network where each of these lines represents a connection between two county centroids. Um, this is an unweighted network at this point, so each of the lines is equivalent, but you can weight the network uh, based on the different dispersal kernels. Okay. So for four hypotheses, let's go fit our models. Our first hypothesis, we're just going to test, we're going to compare a fully connected network for all of uh, the counties in the United States versus those counties that just uh, have caves. We're going to compare the two sets of diffusive models, whether it's diffusive or diffusive with long distance dispersal. And I have a nice little table that people can't read, but what I want to point out is that uh, counties with caves we have more support based on negative log likelihood in AIC for those models, suggesting that reducing it to just the counties with caves, we have more support. For our second hypothesis, whether or not spread is accelerated by high concentrations of caves, we're now going to compare our previously uh, best fit models of uh, simple diffusion and diffusion with long distance dispersal <coughs> with our gravity models. So this first line here is gravity with area and then gravity with caves. Uh, there's more support here for our gravity model with caves. Uh, and there's a difference between gravity and area, or caves and area. The highest support is for the one model with caves. And the beta term associated with that is positive, which suggests acceleration of spread in counties with lots of caves. 
whether or not spread is affected by species richness. We added a species richness term to our uh, gravity model, and we uh, actually see improvement in the likelihood and the AIC, so sh suggesting that these models are more preferred than just the general uh, gravity model. However, when we include the northing, so just the latitude position of the county, uh, we have a better fit than either of the two uh, species richness models, suggesting that that might be some sort of gradient. We're just picking up some sort of gradient in the data rather than uh, an actual effect. And then finally, whether or not spread is retarded in warmer areas due to shorter duration of cold temperatures. So we add our cave model and add that winter term. Lo and behold, we have our best fit model overall. Furthermore, this negative term suggests that spread is retarded in warmer areas. Okay, uh, we fit a couple other things. Uh, we added that species richness term to our winter model and uh, found general support for this jet gravity, gravity model using caves plus our winter term. Very exciting. Okay, so we had three supported hypotheses that uh, we have geographic corridors, that we have spread accelerated by high concentrations of caves, and that spread is retarded in warmer areas. Um, however, we do not find uh, support for a species richness effect necessarily. Uh, we did test a bunch of these other models, uh, and the take home here is not as well supported as the gravity plus caves, uh, or gravity caves model with winter. So the next step is we want to know how we want to apply this model into the future. And so we want to know where will it spread and how fast will it spread. So we simulated forward uh, infections for about 100 years. We did it under uh, current climate as well as climate change predictions. So that's what this looks. These are the results of those simulations. Uh, you can ignore this first kind of light gray thing that doesn't really show up on the screen. Uh, that's uh, the current five years of winter, or five winters. Uh, the blue line represents observed climate, so if climate stayed stable during those first five years of epide the epidemic, how would it change, or how would it spread? And the different <coughs> red uh, base plots are actually different climate change scenarios. The take home message here is that we expect, uh, given the gravity plus winter model, we expect uh, spread to peak in about one to two more winters and then start to tail off. Uh, with climate change, we actually see a faster spread, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive because you would think that the climate change models would slow spread. The problem uh, with that in our data is that the observed data we had were actually warmer than the climate models thought the winters were supposed to be. Uh, so it's actually faster. That's why you see that. Because um, the climate models were run 10 years ago rather than this year. Um, but you can see a consistent pattern where we have uh, maxima or number of new counties infected um, in a couple of years, the maximum distance several years after that, and the total area of extent um, maximizes uh, in 10 to 15 years. Really, we want to know where this actually happens, so we plotted this on the map. These are the median years of spread given the um, uh, a stable climate-based model. Uh, so the light yellow colors that are probably difficult to make out in the back are over right here and in here. Those are the ones that are supposed to uh, happen soon, and we have the most relatively the most confidence in. Uh, so you can kind of see this fill-in effect here in the southeast and in Missouri and into Kansas and Oklahoma. Then you see lighter values here in Colorado. Uh, when we actually analyze the data a little bit more, we can see that one of the counties that we expect to be kind of the focal point for the West is uh, right up in here in Boulder near Grand Col Boulder and Grand uh, counties in Colorado. Uh, but in reality, we see it takes a long time to get throughout most of the Cape Bering areas. Uh, climate change, like I said, this speeds things up. So we have a lot more light white or light yellow colors uh, on the map, but the pattern of uh, spread is consistent regardless of which of the three uh, scenarios we looked at. 
if we actually look at the frequency infection instead of the median year of infection, you can see that although we had predictions in Florida and in Southern California for some of these models, that's actually really low because the light colors represent areas that were not frequently infected during our uh, simulations, uh, suggesting that those values we don't really have to worry about it spreading to Florida because it's likely not going to spread to Florida. But at least the frequency of infection is pretty uh, similar throughout uh, the different four different climate scenarios. So just a few things. Uh, we think spread is mediated by the heterogeneous landscape. So those Ks really have something to do with it. That spread will likely follow a fill-in pattern and then uh, have occasional long-distance dispersal events uh, that will then spread further. Uh, a couple things we have to assume for our projection models is that future spread will be consistent with current spread. For instance, if there are changes in community dynamics within the caves, that that's not going to affect spread. Uh, there are people that are actually looking at that in the field uh, right now, uh, a group out of Boston. Also, whether or not fragmentation affects spread. So what happens if certain nodes go extinct? So certain counties, you just don't have bats anymore. We assume in our model that those are still active caves or active counties. Um, if those go off, is that slow spread, which is what you would kind of expect. Uh, one of the other side groups associated with our projects uh, is examining that and uh, so far hasn't shown too much an effect of fragmentation. <coughs> And then uh, whether or not caves reflect the entire potential uh, habitat. Uh, we didn't have mines in our data set. That was because we couldn't get a good data set of mines reflective of mines that would facilitate hibernation. Um, but we know that bats do hibernate in mines. Uh, we just didn't have the data for that. So I just need to thank uh, people. This is the first half, uh, so KU. Uh, I was in EEB in the Biodiversity Institute. Uh, these were my co-authors on that initial paper and uh, people at KU that were very helpful. Um, and then this is the group at Georgia I was working with. Um, and these are my co-authors on that paper. So, any questions? Are you guys working with anybody, uh, or is there any kind of research on um, the genetics of the fungal uh, the agent uh, itself? Because then, if there was any kind of you know genetic analysis or sort of population genetic type of analysis, yeah. you could kind of map it out and and um, uh, correlate that, or at least uh, you know sort of ground truth your your particular model yeah. for white nose syndrome. So Heather is a. She tried to look into that when we started working on it. So we, had, we were like, oh, let's look at all these different things. And we wanted to look at the genetics to see if there was some sort of pattern to that. And at least published records, we couldn't find anything. Um, uh, I think there are people that are looking at the genetics right now. Um, but I don't have those data. Other questions for Sean? Sure. I guess just more generally, um, the long distance dispersal has been a kind of harder to model part of all that <laughs> spread model beyond disease, also the kind of post collection tree story and stuff. So, can you put this in context of where, give a sense of where modeling efforts have gotten to in terms of incorporating this level of explicitness with dispersal into the species model? Um, I think for the literature uh, I'm familiar with in terms of like invasion and those sorts of things is that a lot of the distance stuff, there's a lot of work on different types of kernels and fitting different kernels and what types of kernels do different things in the geographic space. So I think there's plenty of literature out there that's examining those things. The thing that we found with even the distance effects is that we're still underestimating uh, the year of infection because we're not getting that distance term exactly right. And no matter what we do. So. so yeah, like when we simulate from that first infection for 100 years and see how those first uh, 112 counties, what year they get infected, 
um, a lot of our less fit mo our, our less supported models greatly underestimate the year of infection um, the diffuse diffusion models especially uh, they miss some of those counties by uh, 10 years yeah. if you take the same model that you used for the white nose syndrome mm -hmm. and where you try to predict the future, you mm -hmm. try to apply that to the fake, uh -huh. for example, where you try to fit the kind of data yeah. and see if you have some idea what to control it. Will the predictions, for example, would lead to this uh, 100 meridian being uh, kind of a live stopping spread? I have no idea, but that was an idea that Craig and I were talking about uh, to kind of maybe work on while I was here is try and estimate uh, or look at plague this plague spread um, through time and just see the environmental correlates of that. Um, so that's an idea that got kicked around but hasn't I haven't done anything with it. So. But you could do something like that easily. The, the challenge with plague is that you really um, it's hard to detect, right? Because you only detect it when it's there, and you don't detect when it's not there, right? Uh, or if you're not looking for it. So it's that enzootic part of it that makes it hard. So how many species of bats have actually been documented to have this problem? And is it known in any bats that are not cave dwellers or highly communal? Um, it's as far as I know, it's only in cave dwelling bats. And I want to say the number's like eight or nine species, maybe, that have been infected or have shown positive infection. Because one of the things that's weird is that uh, some of the, so for instance, that Oklahoma uh, occurrence data point, that is a bat that was positive for Geomyces destructans, but we don't know if it was actually had uh, the fungus on the, the muzzle or on the wing, right? It just had a uh, some sort of positive result. Um, so how many species are infected, I think, gets kind of, is it six, seven, eight, nine? It's kind of, I'm not sure. Uh, but it, it's not in <laughs> bats that don't. <laughs> the actual appearance <coughs> of white nose is only in cave-dwelling bats whether or not non-cave hibernating bats facilitate spread, I have no idea. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, do, the, do the bats actually, what happens to them outside of winter when they're not exposed to those cold temperatures or when they're not seriously impacted by being? So you have recovery rates and some, there, you do have some species and some individuals that have recovered after um, exposure and actually growth of, you know, manifestation of the white on the face. Um, and that's happened, there's documented evidence in New York of several caves. And um, the number of bats that are dying in those caves, uh, the proportion is going down, right? The population isn't back up. Uh, but they can survive if they make it out and uh, kind of uh, warm up and get food and get out of that cave, right? Um, so they've been able to save bats by bringing them into the lab. They'll recover. They've documented it, that it happens out in the field as well. Um, so, yeah. so how do you think that the fungus actually is? If, it, if they have the opportunity to shed the fungus during the non-winter season, I mean, how is it that so it that's, it's in that cave winter after winter? Does it just stay there? Or, or do they ever so, really shed it? Or Well, that's... Those are some of the big questions, right? And so that's this group at Boston University is really looking into that. They're already looking in, they're going into some of the caves where they know they have white nose, they've been detecting it, they've been following things for years. And even within a cave, depending on aggregation size, you see differences in um, uh, transmission rates, right? Uh, the other thing is you don't see transmission, just environmental transmission at this time, that they don't see evidence for a bat going into a cave and picking it up. So how that dynamic of, I'm a susceptible individual, I'm gonna end up in this cave, but then I'm gonna get infected. I think it's still kind of a little 
up in the air. Um, and how that actually happens, we're not sure. So, but uh, they're looking into that kind of explicitly. Yeah. One of the, the working hypotheses is that swarming is a big deal. So bats swarming in the fall uh, transmits and moves the fungus around uh, because bats will swarm and then move to the next cave swarm. But I think the group in Boston doesn't show, does not show support for that. Fails to show support for that in some cases. So. But our model is cool with you anyway. <laughs> Did you ever use like daylight, like the amount of daylight or light hours as a covariate in your models? Because I imagine if they're recovering as a function of being able to actually get out and do stuff, then yeah. that could be. So that should still go with our door link, right? Because the daylight hours should reflect the north-south gradient, right? Essentially. So we kind of test for that indirectly. But um, because you can have places that have the same daylight hours, but the productivity can be very different. So we think it probably has something to do with productivity, which leads to condition of the bats. How correlated are bat species richness and cave density? Do you think one of the reasons why species richness didn't matter so much is that it was mostly accounted for by cave density? Um, so, I don't know how correlated they are, but when we fit a diffusive model with species richness, so we don't take into account uh, caves at all, we have a less well-supported model. That was one of the, the big lists that I didn't go through. Further questions for Sean? All right, let's thank him again for a great